Right, hey peeps, um, welcome to Women in Antebellum America, Separation of Spheres and the Cult of True Womanhood. This is a good one. It's going to have all sorts of salacious and ridiculous stuff in it. You'll enjoy it. Uh, before I go on, let me say from now on, I'm going to divide all of these PowerPoints into part one and part two, because when I add narration, the file gets so big, it's really hard to upload. So, cool. On we go to part one. Next slide. Intro stuff. So first, antebellum simply means before the war. What war? The American Civil War, which was 1861 to 1865. So antebellum means uh, that period, as it says there, 1820 to 1860, we usually imagine. Before 1820 is the New Republic, so that was Martha Ballard um, and, and, and the, Re the Revolutionary War. Okay. What's going on? Why do we get a special period for the antebellum period? Well, it feels like right now we are living through this time of immense and shockingly large change. Indeed, people always talk about how, you know, there's no time in, in world history where we were having so much change so fast. And historians are all like nonsense. The, the time of the greatest change, particularly in America, but even worldwide, is the antebellum period, 1820 to 1860, because of the Industrial Revolution. An industrial revolution is not on that list, but all of the things listed there are part of the industrial revolution. They are products of the industrial revolution. Industrialization. The industrialization, industrial revolution gets you increasing sort of factoryization. Not just typical factories that you think of, but like Mount Sac is a college factory. Everybody goes to the place and works there and then goes home, as compared to Martha Ballard's place where you learned at home in your grandma's bedroom. Um, so industrialization. Hospitals are kinds of in factories. They're healthcare factories. Not very good ones always, but nonetheless. Urbanization, that is what factorization or industrialization gives you is people now all have to live kind of in the same place because they're going to work at these big centralized places. Urbanization, the, the moving of people from the country into towns. Immigration. We get in this period our immigration is still primarily Western European, so English, Irish, uh, and some German and French. It'll be after the Civil War you'll get the big uh, Eastern European and Russian immigration, and not till the 20th century really will you get any significant Asian um, immigration, except there's a small group of Chinese who come here in the 1850s. You get the westward movement, because the most important thing the Industrial Revolution gives you for westward movement is the railroad. We think that people went west in wagons and wagon trains, and they didn't. It's railroads. Because there's no reason to go out to the middle of nowhere and build up a farm if there's no railroad there to take the stuff that you grow back to the city where the people live, right? So the westward movement, you get expansion westward. And of course, the rise of slavery, which is all deeply, deeply related to industrialization. We go from a quarter of a million slaves in 1800 to four million slaves in 1860. And we'll talk more about that next week when we do the slavery lecture. But that is an immense change in American history, the sort of exponential explosion of owned human beings in the United States. So that's a lot of stuff, isn't it? Wow. All right, next slide. The map. It gives you sort of a notion of a couple of things, both westward expansion and, and, and firstly, first, if you look at those blue states sort of up there in the top of the northeast, you know, Maine, Mass Maine's where Martha Ballard was from. Massachusetts is the one with the little curly thing on it. Um, that's the old original 13 colonies. Originally then sort of 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, the westward expansion is into western Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and to a slightly lesser extent, uh, Michigan and Minnesota territory. But really, you don't get any significant expansion into that far west, Minnesota territory, Nebraska, Kansas, until the 1850s. And that's when you get some, some people going all the way across, leaping across the American Southwest, because you, nobody can live there, not even the Indians in the summer, um, but to California in the 1850s. Um, and then that great sort of Midwestern part, mo that will essentially not be settled until after the Civil War. Like Montana, 
Nobody's going to go there till like the 1870s. Yeah, cool. Next slide. This is just a nice little map that shows you about industrialization. And, and, and what you have here with these all these colored dots Ooh, immigration stats. Don't write any of these numbers down. Don't make an attempt to, to, to memorize them. You don't care. I don't care. I'm just trying to show you something. What you can see is look where the big numbers are. We get big numbers at Germany. See, 1841 to 1850. Notice we don't have a lot of immigration before that even. Uh, you've got big numbers in Germany, even bigger under 1850s. Look at that for Germany. Um, for England and Scotland, you've got fairly big numbers bigger in the 1840s and the 1850s. Look at the Irish numbers. They're actually uh, uh, um, in the 1840s way bigger than um, Germany. Anybody know why everybody comes here from Ireland in the 1840s? You do, don't you? Yeah, it's the potato famine. And then an ongoing sort of crisis there, an economic collapse, and ongoing Irish immigration in the 1850s. The Irish will be America's great sort of unwashed, monstrous other, they're the bad immigrants, in the same way that for like conservative Americans, uh, Mexican Americans, or Mexican immigrants are bad now. And I'm not saying they are, because I'm not an asshole. But um, for, the, for, for America in the 1840s and 50s, it's the Irish, uh, because they're de one, they're desperately poor, and two, they're Catholic. And so for the Protestants who lived in America, uh, there's a notion that sort of the they felt about Catholics the way many conservatives feel about Muslims today. Oh no, they're this dangerous, horrifying enemy. It's foolish, but it is what it is. Next slide. Slave demographics. I don't even have any numbers on this because I don't want you to feel, or any dates on this. You can see numbers over there on your left, but I don't want you to feel like you have to memorize this either. The point is simply is that there's an exponential rise in slavery over the quarter of the 1800s. If that first little column there on the left is 1800, and this last little big one here on the end is 1860, you see a rapid expansion in the number of slaves in America. And that's going to change, like, everything. That kind of massive expansion of a really radical, really controversial economic system and moral system, or I think, immoral system. Next slide. Just a slave map, again. Uh, you don't even have to write anything down if you don't want to. But again, so you see the distribution of slaves in America. All those, uh, those the, in the, up there in the north, all that green stuff, those are states that abolished slavery. So there's no more slavery up there. And one of the reasons they could abolish slavery up there is because they didn't have a lot of slaves to start with, so they weren't very committed to that economically. And indeed, you'll notice even on the top parts of the South, that pink, that's like less slaves. What happens is you get more and more slaves the further South you go, not because people in the Deep South, white people in the Deep South, are naturally racist, because that's not true. Nobody's naturally racism, racist. Nobody. You're, you're taught that shit. Um, but rather because that's how the climate goes. It turns out that 90% of slaves worked in cotton, and that cotton at the time grew, um, it, it, it still does. It's a long growing season and needs hot places. So cotton grew in the deep south. Also rice, sugar cane, also crops that need long growing seasons and hot weather. So you get that in Alabama, Louisiana, uh, etc. You do not get it up north. Students often ask, what's that green spot there in Florida? That was the Seminole Reservation. The Seminole Indians uh, didn't allow slavery in their part of the state. So that's cool. Next slide. 
All right, so the important point, and point here of all of those slides is that change is constant. You're not living in a time of immense change. Everybody's living in a time of immense change. In all of world history, everybody's living in a time of immense change. Sorry, I was taking a drink. Um, all countries are always changing, uh, but the, nonetheless, the antebellum period in America was a time of really big change, bigger than I think even we can conceive of. As you change all those things about industrialization, you change how people work, industrialization, you change how people live, urbanization, uh, you change the size and shape of the country with westward expansion, um, and, and you change a uh, rapidly increased slavery, thus uh, the creating this massive thing to fight over, and it fundamentally changes the rules for how people live. And when you change the rules for how people live, you change all the rules, including the gender rules. So this is a time where these rules, these notions about women's roles, what a woman was and who she was and what she should do, change drastically. And they will change into the stuff that will sound really familiar to you. That is, you're going to be like, oh, this all sounds familiar as we go forward with this and then even part two. This is where we establish in the 1840s and 50s particularly where we establish the gender rules that we're still trying to buck resist today. Yeah? Cool. Next slide. So separation of fears, spheres, separation of spheres is our first big concept. We're going to do this one, separation of spheres, and we're going to talk about the cult of true womanhood in part two. So here for spheres, it's a word that typically means circles, right? So a sphere is a circle or a globe. Um, but here we're talking about sort of spheres as are places where people are. Like my sphere right now, sadly, is in the home. Recording things and mopping up dog pee and worrying about what dinner is. That is the private sphere. I'm at home. I went out today to the grocery store, wished I could go to work. That's the public sphere. So what indust if we go back to the slide here, industrialization and urbanization mean that increasingly home and work become separate. Remember I talked about this with the Martha Ballard video that we have that it's what we saw in Martha Ballard's world was the last gasp of a world where people's home and work were mixed. At least until I think we're getting back to that in the 21st century and not just because of the COVID thing. But we have increasing in America number of people working from home in America even before this, in part because the internet allows us to do that. But, but typically, home and work are separate and have been since the Industrial Revolution. The public sphere, then, is where America begins to think that that's where work takes place. It is, in reality, where waged work takes place. And I think it's super important, if you're at all interested in being a decent human being, uh, you begin to think about work as waged work and not waged work. Because imagine that work is only the stuff you get paid for is fundamentally, I'm going to say it, sexist. So, but nonetheless, we begin in the 19th century to imagine that waged work happens in the public sphere and that it's gendered male. Now, this is not to suggest that only men worked for wages um, because working class women, poor women have always had to work for wages. A stay-at-home mom is a luxury that historically only the middle class could afford and in this America only the elite classes can afford. But nonetheless the sort of notion that it was a gendered male, that is even women working, there might have been women working in the wage, in the wage sphere, in the public sphere, but that, that somehow denigrated or sullied their womanhood because the public sphere is gendered male. It is a place where men rule. Men are in charge of the public sphere. And the notion was that the public sphere was an active, busy, and dangerous place. Too dangerous for real women, for nice girls. So hard on our gentle psyches to be out there in the hurly-burly, struggling to get ahead. And that the women who did that were somehow unnatural. Yeah, fun, huh? Whee! Uh, uh, the home. Uh, so the private sphere, if the public sphere is the place that is gendered male and is the active, busy, dangerous place that women aren't supposed to be in, even if they are, um, the private sphere is gendered as female. 
It is the home. It is where unwaged work takes place. And it is gendered female, as I said. Now, here's, let's go back to this business about work. When we imagine that work is something that is waged, that was when you say, you know, when people say my wife doesn't work, what we're doing there is we're saying that unwaged work that largely women do, and you can argue with me and say blah, 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 and I'm still going to tell you that statistically women do the vast majority of domestic work in America in the 21st century still. When we imagine that that work isn't work because it isn't waged, we are engaged in making that work invisible and devaluing the people who do it. Okay? So, but we nonetheless in the 19th century get this notion that, that the work that takes place in the home isn't work because it's not paid and because women do it. There's a notion that the home was a refuge, that it was this safe and gentle place where you went to get away from the hurly-burly of everyday public life, a safe place particularly for men to retreat to from the, from the public sphere, you would go home where the little woman would have created this nice, clean, peaceful, safe place. And this notion that women belonged in the private sphere, that indeed it was women's jobs to tend to men and children, I would argue we still think that. I'm not saying that, that we agree with it. I'm not saying that you all believe it or like it. But I'm saying as a culture, we still think that. And this notion that it was a woman's job fundamentally to obey men and to submit to male needs. That is, and you know, we're all, I, my husband the other day was like, oh, there's no cookies. And I was, I hopped up and I, I made some chocolate chip bars so he'd have cookies for dessert. And then while I was doing it, I thought, what am I doing? If I said there's no cookies, he wouldn't spring into action. Oh, Peg. We collaborate in our own oppression, don't we? Yes, we do. Next slide. Yes, this is fun. We're going to talk a little bit about clothes and fashion, which is always fun. Um, the private sphere then becomes all about restriction, right? But it's this place, it's the home that women are supposed to be in the home. You're not supposed to be out in public, that you're supposed to be doing all these these tasks, that the tasks have to be done this way, that your house has to look that way, and if it doesn't, you're a bad woman. And you begin to see that restriction in women's fashions. Like if you look at these pictures here, we got on the left a picture of sort of women dressed in winter wear and on the right women dressed in summer wear. And you'll notice there's just as many layers in the summer wear as there is the winter wear. They're just different. But we have these voluminous skirts. We have overskirts. We have overcoats. We have undercoats. We have bonnets. We have shawls. We have neckerchiefs. We have gloves. It's just layers and layers and layers of clothes. And, and so you begin to get there. And this is true really of any time. We could have done women's history as, as through the eyes of fashion. Like how is it that you can tell in any given period of time how the culture is feeling about women by the, by the fashion. For example, we live in a time where we're really torn. So on one side, there's all this really comfortable, really athletic, go, go, go stuff. On the other side, there's this sort of hypersexual, spank me heels, tight skirts, push up bra stuff. So we're living in a place where we're really confused about fashion, and we, we kind of are trying culturally to do both. Anyway, let's go back to the 19th century and look at more fashion. Next slide. Garments. Gentlemen, go ahead and look. It's all right. Um, so you have layers and layers. So this, this sort of notion that those layers that we saw on the previous slide, here we begin to see underneath them. Um, on the left, you see the, the, the notion, the thing about a corset, what people don't always understand, is first you'd have to wear the chemise, which would be kind of this thing, you see it poking out of there at the top. You would think of it kind of as a cotton nightgown, and you'd put it on and it would come all the way down, so it would be your first layer. Over that, then you would tie your corset, and then um, historically, to get those big skirts, then you tied a number of petticoats, which is a cute and fancy word that just means a shit ton of underskirts. What happens in the 1850s is you get this cool, modern invention. And indeed, women thought of the hoop skirt 
as, as an immense health benefit because when you see that on the picture on the right, that weird um, uh, cage thing. But the notion was, if you see the cage, is that underneath the cage then the woman's legs uh, were essentially unencumbered. She was wearing her chemise and maybe one underskirt and then this cage to get the skirts to go out instead of 16, you know, I don't know, five to 10 layers of petticoats. You imagine how heavy and how uncomfortable and how dirty that many layers of clothes would be because they're scraping the floor too, right? So the notion was that the hoop uh, was, was prevented all of that. And so you begin to get women wearing these huge hoops. Now, don't think for a second that all women in the 19th century wore these. Obviously, slave women did not. Um, but really, any working class or poor woman that had to go to work or had to do stuff couldn't wear this. This is, this is middle class and upper middle class dress wear. And of course, uh, the bigger your hoop, probably the more leisure the lady had. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so again, it's a... And, and the thing about the corsets and all of that is it's all about restriction. We restrict the female body with the corset, all of these skirts, all of this. It's literally wearing a cage. Um, imagine how it would be like to go through a world wearing all that, plus the gloves, plus the little, the little parasol, plus the bonnet, all of that stuff. How stultifying that would be. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. So here we see in this picture, uh, so we've got this nice middle class woman and she's not only, she's wearing all of her restrictive clothes, which you can't see in the picture, but we have here is kind of a, a begin, this notion that in the 19th century, a woman's primary job is to take care of her children. So women have always taken care of children. What we begin, begin to get in the 19th century is this like professional motherhood stuff, you know, and this notion that, that being a mother requires special skills and special stuff. And then with the invention of motherhood as a kind of a job that you had to be able to afford to do right, right? Because there's a certain amount of money in all that crap. Um, that also the invention of childhood. That is, while we have always had children, we have not, we have not historically thought about childhood as a special developmental phase. In the 19th century, we do begin to think of childhood as a special developmental phase, and that these people, these children, needed special clothing, clothing for children, not just small adult clothing, and special toys. So you see in this picture both both the, the woman with all of her clothes and then all of the curtains and the table and the chair, all of the goods, the consumer goods, which, by the way, would have been made in factories by poor people, right? And then and, and the dog, who's the dog, and the book, and also sort of a, an idealized notion of the home and the nuclear family. Everybody's so happy. Everybody's clean. Everybody's well-dressed. They all have lots of stuff. Uh, that is very much, I would argue, our ongoing way in which we understand kind of model family life in America. That there sh you should all be grouped together. That you should be happy. That you should have lots of stuff. Um, and this turns out, one not to be true for everybody, and two, not to be possible for everybody. But nonetheless, we begin to get this standard. And then once you set the standard, then women can either meet the standard and thus be good women, or fail at the standard, be bad women. And of course, all poor women who had to go to work every day and couldn't afford all this crap would not meet the standard. Slave women would not meet the standard. So you'd have all these what we call in-law women and outlaw women. Yay. All right, next slide. Um, um, the point about the separation of sphere stuff is that this stuff, these ideas are sold to Americans, American women and American men as natural. It's not, you have to do this or we're going to punch you in the nose, but rather, oh, ladies, you were just born this way. You were born wanting to be mothers and to take care of the home and to make the beds and wipe the butts. You were born that way and, and or both. God wants it that way. So either a new notion that it was natural because nature made you that way or natural because God wanted it that way. So...
natural, real women, natural women that God approved of, that the natural order approved of, were women who were in the home, being submissive to men, keeping things clean, engaged in unwaged labor, and being professional consumers of products made by poor people. And that bad women were the women found outside of the home who could not do this. And then bad women, and this begins to be true not just in the 19th century, but even in our world today, this notion that somehow bad women are subhuman, unnatural women, um, um, bad. That if you go to somebody's house and that it's dirty, you don't think, what the fuck's that husband doing? You think, how has the wife failed to keep this house clean? And, and I'm almost certain you do think that, even if you're not a sexist. But this notion then in the 19th century, we begin to get that, that, that poor women and slave women are not real women because they can't do this stuff. Now, the next slide says Finney, and it's not Finney. The next slide here. Next slide. Go to part two. Matter of fact, I'll, I'll change that. It says Finney right now, but I'll change it. I'll change the words so when you see it, it says, go to part two. Yeah, well, look, here's some bad women, and they're not bad. They look sad and anxious, but also notice they're wearing all the, all the clothes, too, all the layers. It's interesting. It's a cool picture. Anyway, I'll see you at part two, all right? Good. Thanks, peeps. See you in a second. Bye.